Welcome back to the playlist on neurons, neurotransmitters, and hormones. In this video, we're going to go over the physiology and organic mechanism of this enzyme, which is called choline acetyltransferase. And the ultimate goal of this enzyme right here is to synthesize this molecule right here. This molecule that I've just highlighted in yellow, this molecule is called acetylcholine. This is called acetylcholine. And acetylcholine itself is a neurotransmitter and it has a wide variety of implications which we'll look at in a separate video just to give you sort of a, an intuition on what it might do. Um, it's released by all preganglionic neurons in both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And in the, in the parasympathetic nervous system, it's also released by the postganglionic neuron to the target cell. So for example, if you were looking at um, the innervation of um, a target cell like the heart or the sinoatrial node of the heart by um, this, the parasympathetic nervous system, the preganglionic neuron is the, is the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve, vagus nerve is cranial nerve number 10. That's the preganglionic neuron, right? And then that's ultimately going to be a cholinergic neuron that's going to release acetylcholine, which we often abbreviate as ACH. It releases acetylcholine, which binds to receptors on the postganglionic neuron, which is also cholinergic. So this one's also cholinergic. And then this might go and then innervate the sinoatrial node of the heart, and that leads to a slowing of the heart rate. So both of these neurons are both cholinergic. And we also have to kind of tell what it means to be a cholinergic neuron. Well, when you say you're a cholinergic neuron, what you mean is you express high concentrations of this enzyme, choline acetyltransferase. And so what you're doing is you're synthesizing a large amount of acetylcholine. Okay, so, you know, the vagus nerve, preganglionic, um, parasympathetic neurons are cholinergic. Uh, Postganglionic neurons in the parasympathetic nervous system are also cholinergic. Um, you also have um, some postganglionic sympathetic neurons that are also uh, cholinergic if they're innervating things like sweat glands and so forth. And then you also have um, cholinergic neurons that innervate muscles, right? So part of the somatic nervous system. And then there's also cholinergic neurons within the brain, okay? But the idea is that if you are a cholinergic neuron, you are synthesizing plenty of choline acetyltransferase, and so you're going to be synthesizing a lot of, a lot of acetylcholine. Now, for the reaction, we know we're going to be synthesizing acetylcholine, but we're going to need two substrates. Let me talk about them here. So this molecule right here, this is called choline, and we'll have a whole video on choline eventually. Uh, what we'll find is that choline is mainly um, given through the diet. Um, it's also referred to sometimes as vitamin B4. So this is vitamin vitamin B4. That's not one of your not one of the typical B vitamins that you talk about. But choline itself, it is synthesized in humans to a very small extent. And it's such a small extent that it basically means that vitamin B4 or choline is now considered basically an essential nutrient, meaning that if you want to have healthy levels of things like acetylcholine or certain uh, uh, phospholipids that have choline in it, you've got to get it through the diet. So it's basically now considered one of the B vitamins. But humans do have the enzymes to make it, but not in sufficient quantities. Okay, And we'll also find that it can be salvaged through something called the Kennedy pathway, which can also be used to make um, phosphatidylcholine and things like that. Okay, So choline is really important for acetylcholine synthesis. The other molecule shown here um, is going to be acetyl-CoA. So this is acetyl-S-CoA. And obviously, of course, we can make that. Um, Acetyl-CoA is made from pyruvate by the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, or sometimes you'll see it abbreviated PDH, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, and that makes acetylcholine. 
And so basically what you have to realize about choline acetyltransferase is that it's made significantly in cholinergic neurons. But there's a huge interplay that goes on between choline acetyltransferase and acetylcholinesterase. So actually, before we look at the organic mechanism of this enzyme, let's talk a little bit about the physiology of the cholinergic neuron. So basically what we have right here, this molecule CH, this is choline. Okay, so that molecule, that is choline. And by the way, this structure right here, this is basically the axon terminal. This is the axon terminal of the cholinergic neuron. Okay, and then this is the synapse down here. Okay, so the choline reacts with choline acetyltransferase. So that's what this is. This molecule is choline acetyltransferase. And of course, it uses this molecule right here, which is acetyl-CoA right and it condenses the acetyl part of acetyl coa and the choline to make our friend acetylcholine here's acetylcholine now acetylcholine does no good by itself instead what has to happen is it has to be packaged into vesicles with other acetylcholine molecules so that's where this protein comes in let me highlight it in blue so this protein right here this is called let me write it over here this is called the this is the vesicular, the vesicular acetylcholine transporter. Okay, the vesicular acetylcholine transporter. And this transporter uses something called an adenosine triphosphate hydrolase or an ATPase. Okay, so this particular transporter is going to use something called antiportation. It's going to use something called antiportation which is basically a type of secondary active transport. So basically the first step in getting the acetylcholine molecules into that vesicle, number one is going to be to use the ATPase. So it's an ATP dependent uh, process. So you burn the ATP. In other words, you're going from ATP into adenosine diphosphate plus the inorganic phosphate. Of course, that's gonna require water, okay? And in the process, what that does is it pumps, it pumps protons into the vesicle, into the vesicle, okay? Now, the protons don't really like it so much inside the vesicle, so it, it raises them in potential energy to be inside the vesicle. So to alleviate that potential energy strain, we're going to get the next step. So once those um, protons get inside the vesicle, they don't like to be in there, so they're going to rush back out. And that, that exiting, so exiting of the protons, that's associated with a delta G that is less than zero. Okay, So that process of the protons exiting is spontaneous. Okay, It has a negative delta G. It's exergonic. releases free energy. And that release of free energy is used to pump acetylcholine into the vesicle. So pumping acetylcholine into the vesicle, that has a delta G that is greater than zero. So by coupling the, um, the exiting of protons back into the axoplasm with the non-spontaneous movement of acetylcholine into the vesicle, what you end up doing is you create an overall spontaneous process. So just, to, just to review what we're doing, an ATPase, which is a proton pump, pumps protons, number one, into the vesicle. So protons are coming first into the vesicle. And then in the next step, the protons exit, but in the process, the free energy that's released upon exiting is used to ultimately drive the acetylcholine into the vesicle. So now what you have is this situation right here, where you have a whole bunch of acetylcholine molecules that are inside the vesicle. Okay, And the vesicle is eventually going to make its way down to um, the axon terminal that borders the synapse. Okay and through the use of a voltage-gated calcium channel. So we're going to use a voltage-gated calcium channel. We'll talk more about those in another video. And in fact, you can go watch the video right now if you need to. But the voltage-gated calcium channel is going to cause the vesicle to fuse with the membrane of the axon. Okay, and it's going to form this thing right here, which we call an omega loop. 
We'll talk more about that in the voltage-gated calcium channel video. But we form this omega loop, and ultimately what that does is notice it creates a space in here through which the acetylcholine can now exit. It can now exit the axoplasm, and then it goes into the synapse right here. So now the acetylcholine's in the synapse. And potentially some of this acetylcholine will make it across the synapse and of course bind to this guy, which is the acetylcholine receptor. But eventually the acetylcholine, if it, you know, even if it makes it to the receptor, eventually it's going to be hydrolyzed by this enzyme right here, which is called acetylcholinesterase. And we have a whole video on that as well. So what acetylcholinesterase does is it takes acetylcholine right here. And by the way, it's a serine hydrolase. And it uses water and it hydrolyzes it into acetate, which gets released. We'll talk about that more in another video. And choline. Okay. And so this, these cholines right here, this group of cholines, eventually will get transported back up into the axoplasm through this transporter right here, which is called the choline transporter. Notice it's not the acetylcholine transporter. There are no known acetylcholine transporters. What you have to do essentially is you have to break down acetylcholine once it's in the synapse, get it into choline, transport the choline back up into the axon, and then remake the acetylcholine with the choline acetyltransferase. So there's no way to transport acetylcholine directly. You have to break it down and then rebuild it. And of course, it's going to be an ATP dependent process, okay? And also, you're going to have to use acetyl CoA, so you're going to burn some energy in the process, okay? Now, one thing I do want to mention before we go any further into the organic mechanism of choline acetyl transferase is that, number one, the choline acetyl transferase is not actually made in this axon terminal, okay? It's actually made in the soma. So, this enzyme right here, choline acetyl transferase, this is a, an enzyme that's made in the soma, but keep in mind, remember the structure of the axon. So if this is your axon, right, there's your axon, remember that you have these, these microtubules, right, that run, down, that run down the center of the axon into the end bulb. So literally what happens is the choline acetyltransferase gets packaged into vesicles that then attach themselves onto the microtubules in the axon. And they're attached through a protein called kinesin, and they literally just sort of walk the vesicle down here into the axon end bulb, and then it releases choline acetyltransferase ultimately into the axon terminal, where it will then catalyze the conversion of choline and acetyl-CoA into acetylcholine. Okay, so that's how choline acetyltransferase makes it in to the end bulb. It's made in the soma, but it gets transported down through the vesicle microtubule network. Okay. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of intuition on this enzyme. Now let's actually look at the organic mechanism, and you'll find it's actually really simple. So I'll do the mechanistic steps in green. So there is a critical histidine residue in the active site that is in the deprotonated state at rest. And the first mechanistic step is it's going to deprotonate the choline at the hydroxyl group, which induces nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl thioester of acetyl-CoA. And that generates what we call a tetrahedral intermediate. So obviously, I'm grossly oversimplifying the CoA structure. You can certainly go look at that on Wikipedia. Um, but this structure right here, this is important. This is called a tetrahedral this is a tetrahedral intermediate and in all serine and cysteine proteases or cysteine or serine hydrolases this is of course going to be an intermediate whenever you have nucleophilic attack on the trigonal planar complex so this is the tetrahedral intermediate and like all of those it's going to collapse back down so the carbonyl is going to reform but it's, it has to kick off a leaving group otherwise this carbon would have five bonds and that can't be the case so in order to alleviate having five bonds, when the carbonyl reforms, it kicks off a leaving group. And the leaving group in this case is going to be the coenzyme A. And as it leaves, the th effective thiolate is going to reabstract the proton from the histidine residue, and that regenerates deprotonated histidine and coenzyme A, which can then in, uh, redo a cycle of the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex in which it forms another acetyl-CoA. And then, of course, at the very end of this reaction scheme, you get the desired product, which is acetylcholine. So this is acetyl, this is acetyl 
acetylcholine. And we'll have a whole video on the function of acetylcholine, more from an anatomy and physiology perspective. But hopefully this gives you a little bit of intuition on how it's made um, and ultimately how its function interplays with the actions inside the synapse. So just to do a quick review of the function of this, let's, let's go now. So choline acetyltransferase is in the axoplasm axon terminal, and it catalyzes the condensation of the acetyl group of acetyl-CoA with choline, and that gives you this guy right here, if I can get my marker. This is acetylcholine, and then something called the vesicular acetylcholine transporter. First of all, uses an ATPase to pump protons into the vesicle, and then the protons exit the vesicle back into the axoplasm through a process that has a spontaneous delta G, a delta G less than zero, and when they exit, that particular spontaneous process is coupled with the transport of acetylcholine into the vesicle. So you couple something with a negative delta G with a positive delta G to make the whole thing thermodynamically favorable. So that's an example of secondary, that's secondary active transport. Okay, secondary active transport. Then the vesicle filled with acetylcholine is going to come over here to the um, junction between the axoplasm and the synapse. And using the action of this, which is called a voltage-gated calcium channel, okay, the vesicle is going to fuse with the membrane, forming something called an omega loop, which is characteristic of all vesicle exocytoses. And that's going to cause the acetylcholine to leave the axoplasm and go into the synapse right here, okay? And when it's in the synapse, some of it might bind to the acetylcholine receptor on the next neuron, or, you know, some of them could be instantaneously hydrolyzed by acetylcholinesterase, this enzyme right here, but eventually, eventually, the way you terminate an acetylcholine response is not by reuptake. Remember, there are no transporters for acetylcholine. It's not by reuptake, it's by enzymatic degradation. And acetylcholinesterase is the enzyme that degrades acetylcholine into choline and acetate. The acetate will be dealt with in another video. But the choline gets reuptaken by a choline transporter which is this guy right here. This is the choline transporter. And then choline can then go and be recycled with another reaction of choline acetyltransferase to make acetylcholine, okay? So hopefully this video gave you a little bit of intuition on choline acetyltransferase. In the next video, we're gonna look at what happens um, with acetylcholinesterase. And after that, we're gonna look at the metabolism of acetate. See you in the next video.